Some pedagogies were possible in the past, but impractical because of cost or time. While it would be great to take a class to an archaeology dig site in Spain, the virtual reality experience would be much less expensive in both time and money than traveling to Spain. Yet give the students a more immersive, closer to real life experience than reading a textbook about dig sites or even watching a video. Another example of this is video feedback and reflection pedagogies that were used sparingly in the past because the process was so labor intensive given the technology available at the time. So for example, my high school volleyball team uh, used video reflection and playback, but it took so long, we only maybe used it twice during the season. Now online tools make this powerful pedagogy more accessible because it is cheaper, the, the hardware is cheaper, and the process of creating the reflection videos is so much quicker. So VideoN is a great example of how the confluence of a YouTube API and a web app can make for a powerful tool for video reflection and feedback that is much quicker and easier to use than videotape and TVs uh, of 20, 30 years ago. This is what I use for the soccer teams I coach, and it is a great tool for self-reflection. Not only can the students watch the video, they can pause it, tag a particular section of video, reflect on their performance in that, vi in, that, uh, in that video segment, whether it be something that's positive or maybe something that they did work at, put their comment in the chat, and then I as a coach can go in and respond to that. And we can have a conversation about what's going on. Um, and that reflective process can be powerful and is facilitated and uh, in a format so it can happen much more frequently because of the digital tools that we now have available to us. It can be used in other disciplines as well, whether it be drama, uh, law school interviews, athletics, teacher instruction. I love this quote. Nothing works better than a good teacher unless it's a good teacher with good tools. However, a highly motivated group of students with good tools can seed even with poor instruction. I just want to give you a quick uh, story to demonstrate this. When my partner was in her first year of nursing school, she and her cohort had a substitute anatomy and physiology prof, and he did not teach very well. Uh, he was a substitute for their class, had been, I believe, a, uh, an animal biologist, so he had some anatomy and physiology experience, but just not with the human body. He'd be given uh, a set of PowerPoint slides, which he basically read off of, and the class discovered occasionally would give factually incorrect answers to questions that uh, he was asked in class. My wife and her classmates complained to the nursing program and the biology head, but they couldn't make a change because of uh, budget issues that they were having. So what did my partner and her class cohort do? They started to use their cohort Facebook group that they used to occasionally organize parties and social, social events to share YouTube videos to explain the biological concepts that the professor was not adequately explaining in class. And if anyone in the group didn't, still couldn't understand the, the concept, um, they would ask in the Facebook group for help. Typically one of the people in the group that already had a, a grasp of the concept would uh, spend some time, usually in a, a video, video conversation to explain to the person who was struggling uh, how the concept worked. And they did this the, the whole semester long. And by the end of the semester, there are five sections of this class the section that they were in with the poor instruction. Uh, they all wrote a common exam and the, and the section with the poor instruction scored the highest average mark on the final exam. What would Clark and Cosma say about our fearless group of nursing students? I think that they would both say that the social media technologies that the nursing students used enabled them to use a new pedagogy, that being 
the peer tutoring, peer mentoring, and the sharing of uh, videos that wouldn't have been possible in an analog world or would have been much more expensive and difficult in an analog world to the point of not being possible, practically speaking. So while we don't know exactly why the class did so well on that final exam, I suspect that Facebook enabled them to collaborate more efficiently as a group by sharing videos and engaging in online peer-to-peer -peer tutoring. They also probably spent more time working on the class uh, studying and trying to understand things than the students in the other sections because they were rightly afraid that they would fail on the final exam if they didn't put in the extra time and effort. They were able to crowdsource the educational videos and the peer tutoring in order to make up for what they weren't getting from their teacher and this led to an A minus average on the common final exam. So as you think about creating a new multimedia learning object or buying a new tool for your class, please consider whether or not the new technology is enabling a new pedagogy. And if it's not necessarily enabling a new pedagogy, you don't need to say no, but you might want to follow up by asking yourself, does the technology improve access or does the technology save on costs? Because even if the pedagogy, if the tool isn't enabling a new pedagogy, if it increases access to people who may not be able to easily get at the resources or saves money, those are other valid reasons, obviously, to, uh, to invest in the time and effort into implementing a new educational technology or, or multimedia learning tool. So answering these questions about ed tech and multimedia new ed tech and new multimedia will be a good guide to let you know if you're buying into a vendor's ed tech hype or have found a tool that is really worth the time uh, and effort 